Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you for your word, and I thank you that you open up your word, and that you disclose your word, and that you reveal your word. And I ask for your Holy Spirit tonight to guide our steps and to direct our paths. I ask for your Holy Spirit to unfold what is in your word, that we might come to that word, come to that rhema, come to that personal understanding, and grow and abide in the truth that sets us free and others as well. So Lord, we thank you for that word tonight, and we ask you to have your way by your anointing, in Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we're going to look at two passages, and uh, the only reason we're looking at these two passages is that these two passages have two words in them, and these two words, in some translations, are translated as the word homosexual. And this is Greek, we're looking at the New Testament, and so the words that I have on the overhead are going to be the words that we'll be looking at. They are number 3120 in the Strong's Concordance, the word malakos, and number 733 in the Strong's Concordance, arsenikoites. And you will see that those words uh, are used very few times in the Bible at all. Of course, they would be in Greek, they would only be in the New Testament. They're used very few times in the New Testament. The word malakos, uh, 3120, literally means soft. That's what it means. And uh, the other word, arsenikoites, is a word that Paul made up. We know that because that word shows up no place in, the, in Greek literature anywhere in the world except in these two particular passages of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. Only in those two places in the Bible out of all of Paul's writing do the, does this word arsenikoites show up. It's a compound word like regonomics. A compound word that puts two words together that Paul expects his hearers to understand what it means but nowhere else is this word used. And it is made up of the two words, 730 in Strong's, the word that means lifting, and 2845 in Strong's, the word that means couch, coite, just means couch. So you've got two words put together, lift couch, lift a couch. And that's literally what that word is. Now, that word is not used anywhere else except those two places in Scripture. Malakos is used a few other places, and we'll look at that. Um, but this word arsenikoites um, is not seen in human history for another 400 years. And anything can happen to an obscure word in 400 years. Can you imagine, take the word Reaganomics, and uh, let's assume that in another 50 years the United States went to war and we lost that war and our culture was obliterated. And then uh, other cultures rise up out of our ashes and down the road things happen and in 400 years from now someone comes across something in a book in a library and they come across this word Reaganomics 400 years from now with our society totally gone and, and uh, you know, just bits and pieces and fragments of it in history left and maybe archaeologists trying to find something about it, what happens to a word in 400 years? In um, 400 years ago, there was a word that was described, uh, that used to describe God. And now if we would use that word in English, it was an English word used 400 years ago to describe God, and if we used it today, and uh, referring to God, people would think you were just awful, just terrible. How would you say something like, the word is awful? Awful is the word. And if you said God is awful, they'd think, well, you can't say God's awful. God's not awful. God's good. But to 400 years ago, to say that God was awful, it meant that God was filled with awe. And so you see that here's a word, our Senecoites shows up 400 years later, and it's only by somebody who's translating what Paul says, and he doesn't have any idea what it is that Paul said. Paul was assuming his hearers would know what he meant when he was writing to that local church in Corinth and when he was writing to Timothy uh, about that situation. In fact, interestingly enough, translators today 
take this word, our senakoites, and they interpret it to mean a myriad of things. And so I'm going to give you some, uh, some translations and tell you what these particular translations translate these two words to be. First, we'll look at the, the passage that uses both words is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and that's verse 9. And so that's the scripture we need to look at tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. And here it says, Know ye not, reading from the King James, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. The word effeminate is this word malakos, the first word for soft. Nor, here's the word 733, our senecoites, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's what King James translates this word to be. Remember, this is lift couch. So King James translates lift couch to mean abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, remember, we've got two words here. One is the word soft, and the other one is the word lift couch. Now, as I go through this list, and I'm going to uh, back up and go through this list again so that you remember, we're looking at the two words that follow the word adulterer so that you can identify those two words when you hear them out of different passages because adulterer you'll understand, but when you look at all these other words that these words get translated into, you're not sure you're looking at the same word at all. So. Uh, but I want to continue on with this passage. I'll begin again with verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now that is enough in itself for some people to take that scripture to say, obviously, homosexuals will never, ever, ever get into the kingdom of God. As long as a person is a homosexual, they can never be saved. And it's based on this particular assumption right here from this scripture that says, the effeminate nor the abusers of themselves with mankind on, 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 shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, which then implies to some people that then obviously some were homosexuals, but now they are not homosexuals. And that's how you get this whole movement of ex-gays, where people now say, you know, well, I was gay, but I'm not gay anymore. And I used to be a homosexual, but now I'm a heterosexual um, because I used to be, but now I'm not anymore because now I'm saved. Well, we look at these looking, remember the word adulterer is first, and then come these other two words. In the NIV, well, let's back up, King James. So King James calls them effeminate, malakos, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. The NIV, after it adulterers, comes male prostitutes or homosexual offenders. Now that's different because if I were to say to you, oh, that man is so effeminate, would you automatically assume he was a male prostitute? Those are different words, completely different concepts. The same thing is true if I said, oh, that person is an abuser of themselves with mankind, or if I said they're a homosexual offender. A homosexual offender would be somebody who breaks the law who happens to be homosexual, wouldn't it be? So a homosexual offender could be a gay person who runs a red light and gets pulled over by the police. They've committed an offense, they would go to traffic court for that. Um, that may not be what NIV had in mind, but nonetheless, that's, that's uh, what's there. The Living Bible says adulterers, and then it says, nor homosexuals, and it only gives one word. So it combines malakos and arsenikoitos into one word, the word homosexual. So Living Bible says, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, and goes on. 
So it's combined both words and this, these both people, both words are homosexual. The interlinear Bible, it's, it says uh, adulterers nor abusers. The second word, abusers. Now we're, that's interesting that they're saying the word soft is an abuser. Because you would think of an abuser as not being a person who's soft. You would think of an abuser as being, if you're going to look in terms of soft versus hardness, you would think of the person being abused as the one who was soft and the one who was abuser as being the one who was hard. And so it's very unusual that you would see the word soft get translated into the word abuser. That doesn't make too much sense. But the interlinear Bible, and that's the Bible that I showed last week that goes word for word for word, every single word in Greek, and gives the uh, translation and gives the Strong's number with each word. So they've taken malakos, the word soft, and said that's abuser. And then they take the word arsenikoites, and they say that's homosexual. So abusers and homosexuals. Now those are two different groups of people, abusers and homosexuals. It doesn't say abusers of what even? Abusers of cigarette, abusers of cocaine, abusers of people, you know, abusers of money, abusers of what? It doesn't say abusers of what? And the word is literally soft. So abusers and homosexuals. Now remember, Living Bible puts it all together and just says homosexuals. Then you've got the revised standard and it says adulterers, nor, and puts the two words together and calls them sexual perverts. Now sexual perverts, if I said to you, that person is a sexual pervert, do you think automatically of a homosexual? What do you think of? Many times you think of a, a, a person who molests a little girl or you know, something, you know, somebody, a child abuser, something like that, a sexual child abuser. Uh, something like that, but that's the word that they translate that. Now that's the revised standard. J.B. Phillips uh, says the first word adulterer, then they say the effeminate, and then they say the pervert. So the pervert, now that brings up a whole other concept. Who is a pervert? What is a pervert? If I were to ask a police officer, uh, do you have anyone on file who's a pervert? they would probably pull up a file, but it, would that necessarily be a homosexual? You see, they would pull up all kinds of people who were perverts according to police reports. Same thing with effeminate. Now that word soft, effeminate, gets translated effeminate. It makes you wonder, is it so that the Bible is saying that someone who's just a little effeminate, just, and you've met people like that throughout your life, people are just a little effeminate. Uh, an effeminate person, a feminine male, could well be happily married to a wife, have several children, be uh, loyal to that wife, have no intentions of cheating on that wife, and yet the Bible says about whoever this effeminate or this malakos, this soft person is, it says, such were some of you but. So in other words, it would imply that they're no longer who they were. Uh, they're no longer effeminate if they were effeminate. So that would imply that their whole uh, structure and their way of relating and their whole character and personality has completely been transformed once they're saved. And yet that's not so. If a person's effeminate before they're saved, they're effeminate after they're saved. That doesn't change. And we know that. So, but yet the J.B. Phillips translation calls them effeminates and perverts. So you see, we're not really just talking about homosexuals. Even Bible translations, modern Bible translations, cannot agree what these words are. So we're really walking on uh, very shaky ground to start condemning homosexuals and to start building a doctrine that says once a gay person is saved, they will be a heterosexual automatically. We're walking on very shaky ground. The Amplified Bible. And, uh, and the Amplified Bible is a good translation because it will take a word in Greek or in Hebrew and it'll expand it and give you many of the several meanings that are available. So Amplified says adulterers. Then it says, lumps these two words together and says, nor those who participate in homosexuality. Now there's a world of difference between people who participate in homosexuality and people who are homosexuals because you could be a homosexual and never participate in homosexual conduct. You may never have a sexual experience. 
Or you could be a person who, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, because being a homosexual doesn't necessarily talking about sexual activity at all. It's a, who a person is and how they relate to people of the opposite sex and people of the same sex and who they are in their psyche, who they are emotionally, who they are as a person. And so uh, it's not condemning a homosexual in the Amplified, it's condemning people who participate in homosexuality. Now you have that situation in prison. You have that situation uh, in in combat situations. Lots of different situations where there are no people of the opposite sex and yet there are people who are attracted to people of the opposite sex but those opposite sex members are not available. And still, uh, so you will see that's the kind of person who obviously is being addressed here in the Amplified Bible. Those who participate in homosexuality. Now the New English Bible says uh, none who are guilty of either adultery or homosexual perversion. Now I'd like to know what is homosexual perversion? <laughs> well, it's a good question. What is homosexual perversion? But that's what the New English Bible says, our Senecoites is, and you will see it does not give any translation for the word malakos. So malakos is just dropped and le you're left with the word uh, homosexual perversion. So that means a homosexual who's not a pervert is okay, but a homosexual who is a pervert is condemned in this passage. Well, who is that person? Well, they exist. I'm sure there are homosexual perverts that exist. I'm sure there are. Then the New King James Version says something very interesting. They say uh, adulterers nor homosexuals. So the first word, they translate malakos to be homosexual. Then the second word, they translate sodomite. Now, isn't that intriguing? That's intriguing. And in the footnote in the New King James, in the Spirit-Filled Bible, Spirit-Filled Life Bible, the, um, uh, the footnotes, there are footnotes to the word homosexual and footnotes to the word sodomite. So the footnote to the word homosexual, they've got a little one and you look down to see the one, and it says catamite. Now, isn't that clarification? So you go from homosexual to catamite. Now, isn't that interesting? So Malakos becomes catamite from homosexual based on their own footnote. And sodomite, uh, their footnote number two then, says those submitting to male homosexuals. Now, people who submit to male homosexuals don't necessarily have to be homosexual at all. Someone who submits. Well, you know, sometimes children submit to their aunts and their uncles and their parents and other things and sexually not uh, willingly, but they submit because they're afraid or they, they're terrified or, they're, you know, or, or to other kinds of abuse because they're told if you don't, you know, you're going to be whatever. And so, um, so that could be what's being talked about here, but that's the footnote. Those submitting to male homosexuals is the footnote to explain sodomite. Which is intriguing because the word sodomite doesn't usually imply that. The word sodomite usually implies the active partner in sodomy as opposed to the receptive partner. But their footnote explains it as being the receptive partner in sodomy. Someone who's submissive. So there's a great deal of confusion here. And obviously most people don't have any idea what they're talking about. Because their footnotes don't explain anything. They bring more confusion. Then we have the New American Standard Bible. And that uh, gives the word, the first word translated, malakos, soft, as effeminate, same as the King James Version. The second word, arsenikoites, they, they call those people homosexuals. So homosexuals unqualified, no matter what kind of homosexual, no matter what kind of lifestyle they lead, no matter who they live with or don't live with, or maybe they're the kind of person who's always lived with mama and has never left home and has always stayed there, still that person's condemned, doesn't make any difference, homosexual unqualified. So that's what New American Standard does. Barclay, uh, Barclay's translation uh, says the word adulterer, they don't even use the word adulterer, they use the word rapacious. So, nor rapacious, nor sensualist, that's malakos, nor homosexuals. So sensualists are malakos and homosexuals are arsenikoites. 
And then we go to the Good News Bible. It doesn't sound like good news so far, but nonetheless, we have adulterers or, now interestingly, interestingly, adulterers or, now they put it into one word, homosexual perverts. Again, what is a homosexual pervert? Is it the same thing as a heterosexual pervert or is it, a, is it a different somehow? You know, because we've got to look at the word pervert. So you see, here's this word, lift couch. And this word lift couch gets translated all these different ways. Now this word, arsenikoites, is used twice in the Bible. It's only used in 1 Timothy 1.10 and this passage we just looked at, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Only two times. And do you know that almost without exception, because see the word malakos is not used in 1 Timothy, only the word arsenikoites is. So those two words, malakos and arsenikoites, will only show up in 1 Corinthians 6. But... Uh, the one word, arsenikoites, is used in both those passages and almost without exception, every single translation retranslates the word arsenikoites to be something different when they get to 1 Timothy. Let me give you an example. So we're looking at 733 in Strong's, arsenikoites. In the NIV, they translated the word arsenikoites in 1 Corinthians to be homosexual offender. They translate that same word in 1 Timothy to be perverts. Now, how did they get from a homosexual offender to a pervert? Same word, lift couch, NIV. The Living Bible has condensed both words, malakos and arsenikoites, into the word homosexual. But obviously they didn't need the word malakos because when they get to 1 Timothy and malakos is not there, they retranslate it again as homosexual. Interesting, they take two words, put them together and say that's homosexual, then they've only got one of those words and now that's still homosexual. What happened to malakos? What was malakos? They just dropped it. So we don't know who is malakos and whoever malakos is is no longer being condemned. They're not being talked about. They were never addressed. And if I was the person who is translated the word soft and I want to know you know how to get my behavior right with God I'm not addressed in that Bible I can't figure out that I'm I'm somehow uh, need to change my behavior somehow because I'm not ever talked about it's all lumped together as this one word homosexual the interlinear Bible uh, retranslate homosexual as homosexual the revised goes, remember, they, the revised version took when adulterers and then they went, they combined both words into the word sexual pervert. Now, when they get to 1 Timothy, sexual perverts become sodomites. See, it's the same word. You ought to say sexual perverts in 1 Corinthians 6 and sexual perverts in 1 Timothy. But now it's sodomites. Completely different word. A sexual pervert is different than a sodomite, isn't it? I would think somebody that ties somebody uh, up and then uh, uh, rapes them and keeps them in a closet and hidden in a cave or something, you know, where they can't get food and water and, and does all kinds of things. You can talk about people who are sexual perverts. We don't have to go too far in the newspaper to find people who are, are convicted of that sort of thing. But then all of a sudden, they, the same word becomes sodomite. It's very, very confusing. J.B. Phillips had translated the word 733, arsenikoites, in 1 Corinthians as the word pervert. Now they retranslate it in 1 Timothy to be the sexually uncontrolled. Sexually uncontrolled. Why do you need to, if you've translated it once and you agree with your translation, why do you need to retranslate it again when you've got the same word? But they do. The Amplified uh, had called that word those who participate in homosexuality. They come to 1 Timothy and now they translate it those who abuse themselves with men. Those who participate in homosexuality becomes those who abuse themselves with men. The New English Bible takes the word for um, 
Malakos and Arsenikoi test, puts them together, called it homosexual perversion, homosexual perversion, and retranslates it as perverts. Now, are they perverts or are they homosexual perversions? There's a world of difference because if you're just talking about perverts, you're incorporating heterosexual, bisexual, any kind of sexual uh, pervert. Okay, New King James Version uh, takes the word homosexual and catamite and then gives you, then they, the next word they give for 733 was sodomite. They decided it is sodomite and they stay with sodomite. They stick with it. Those who are submitting to male homosexuals. Those who submit to male homosexuals. Never mind the male homosexuals. Just those who submit to them. Then in the New American Standard Bible, they're consistent. They stay with homosexual both times. It's just homosexual. We don't care if they live with their mom, have never had a sexual experience, don't know anything about anything, never been outside that house. Homosexuals, period. Then we've got Barclay. Uh, he stays consistent with, he's the one, remember, the adulterers were rapacious and the sensualists were uh, malakos. And then the next word, arsenikoitis, was the word homosexual in 1 Corinthians. Now, he sticks with homosexual in 1 Timothy. Good News doesn't. Good News called them homosexual perverts by putting the two words together. And now is just going to talk about sexual perverts. Sexual perverts. So you can see if people want to say, well, the Bible says that homosexuals are not getting into heaven, which Bible? I'd like to know, because it's very confusing, and it's certainly not convincing, especially since here's a word, uh, arsenikoites, that people are translating, some people are translating perverts, some people are translating those who abuse themselves with mankind. Do you know what it is to abuse yourself? You know, people abuse themselves in all kinds of ways. You can say you abuse yourself with uh, food. You abuse yourself with cigarettes. You abuse yourself with drugs. And so a person could abuse themselves with mankind. What would that imply? That would imply that their sexual activity is uncontrolled. They just can't seem to control their sexual appetite and its outlet. And so that's what that would imply. Now that wouldn't imply heterosexuality or homosexuality. Or even be, it could be talking about bisexuality. You don't know who that person's talking about. All you know is that their, uh, their sexual activity is uncontrolled. It's out of control. That's all we know from that word. And here's this word that shows up nowhere in the human race except in these two passages in the Bible. And, we, you know, we translate the Bible. Many times translators figure out what a word means by looking at other pieces of literature from that time frame and figure out, oh, yes, that word, that word, yes, that's what that word is. And that's how we know. Um, you know, that's how we knew agape was God's concept because phileo and eros and storge, other words for love, were very common and prevalent words in the Greek literature, but agape was a new concept. That's how we knew that because we just compare Greek literature, and we have plenty of Greek literature to look at. This word, our Arsenikoites, was never written anywhere. Nobody ever found this word. So Paul coins a word that only he knows, putting two words together, lift couch, and expects us to understand, his reader to understand it. And today, Bible translators do not agree, even when they retranslate that same word in the same Bible. They do not agree. So to make a case against all homosexual people based on this one word doesn't work. Okay, now we also know that this word malakos is used in other places in the Bible. And I'll show you where it's used. It's used twice in Matthew chapter 11 verse 8 and once in Luke chapter 7, verse 25. Again, it's Malachos 3120 in Strong's is used twice 
in Matthew chapter 11, verse 8, twice, and once in Luke chapter 7, verse 25. I'll read you Matthew 11, verse 8, since it's used twice there. <clears throat> and here's what it says, chapter 11, verse 8. King James I'm reading from. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. There's the word malakos twice, soft. What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment, malakos, soft clothing, malakos raiment. Behold, they that wear soft, malakos, clothing are in king's houses. Okay, the only other place that we have this uh, word used besides 1 Corinthians 6, 9, remember it's not in the 1 Timothy passage, it's only in the 1 Corinthians passage, but it's also in Luke chapter 7, and in Luke chapter 7, verse 25, we're going to see the word malakos again, 7:25. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. <laughs> Here's the only place in the Bible that this word's used. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled, there's a different word, so it's only used once in 725, in the Luke 725, and live delicately are in king's courts. So you see the word soft means soft. It doesn't mean catamite. It doesn't mean pervert, unless they are saying those clothed in perverted clothing are in king's houses. So now we're looking at uh, kings of the earth, President Clinton or others that we might look at, those dressed in malakloss clothing. What does that mean? Uh-oh. Well, I think it means soft because it means soft. Amen. You with me so far? All right. I haven't lost anybody, have I? Well, there's some things we need to figure out then. Paul knew what he was talking about. See, Paul wasn't stupid, first of all. He knew what he was talking about when he said our son of Koites. He understood what lift couch meant. And it was something obvious that would have been obvious to the church at 1 Corinthians. And also to the church at Corinth. It also implies, we know because he's writing to this church, so it's something that they could just look around and say, well, yes. And Paul said, such were some of you. So obviously they know from personal experience something that they, they can say, yes, I was this. And so we have to now go back into uh, archaeology and anthropology and look into some things that we know from the first century about Rome, the Roman Empire, what do we know about society at that time? What was happening? Well, there are some things that are happening that are so well documented, they're so clear cut, that there's, there's no question as to whether this was going on or not. And we know very clearly so many documented sources that we don't even have to argue, there is no argument as to whether there was something going on in that society that people would just say, yes, we know what you're talking about, of course. Well. There is a, um, a well-established fact that young boys were considered to be the most sexually desirable people in their society in Greek culture. Young boys, not men by any means. Because as soon as they got older and old enough to start looking like men, started to have their voice deepen and started to have a few characteristics that changed, they were no longer considered sexually desirable. But they were considered sexually desirable as boys. We also know that it was a very common practice in that day and age that an older man who was presumably a heterosexual but who had a trade and who could take someone under his wing to apprentice that person into that trade, often would take a young boy, for instance, if you were a carpenter or uh, whatever else you might have been, would have taken that young boy, brought him under your wing, 
brought him into your household, you would have fed him, you would have clothed him, but you also would have taken sexual favors from that boy. That was a very common practice. In fact, it was uh, just expected. It was a status symbol more than it was a sexual thing. It was kind of like, you know, I'm wealthy enough and well established enough that I can afford to take on a boy. Because that boy would have been treated very well for those sexual favors. And as soon as uh, the boy became old enough to look like a young man, out. The sex activity's all over. That's it. And it was, it was not considered to be homosexual activity, although it was homosexual activity. It wasn't considered homosexual activity because the man was considered to be a heterosexual man. He would have been married. He would have had children. In fact, uh, he would not have been abusing his own children this way. He wouldn't have taken advantage of his own sons this way. But in fact, he would just be taking someone else's son under his wing for this particular purpose. Now we know that was a, uh, a well, you know, well documented. Uh, these sexual liaisons between men, adult men and young boys are well documented. We also know that uh, when the boy became apprenticed and was now able to start working for himself or working in conjunction with the man and was able to, was, you know, older, past 12, 13 years old, then he was expected to get a wife and to start having children and to start having a family. It wasn't expected for him to continue on in homosexual activity for the rest of his life. It was merely something he had to put up with on the way to a goal. Now, when you become a Christian, because that particular arrangement is a power arrangement. And you start getting convicted because you're supposed to, according to the word, love your neighbor as yourself. You're supposed to consider others more highly, esteem others more highly than yourself. It's very difficult with the Holy Spirit residing in you to maintain that kind of a power relationship, an abusive relationship with somebody. And you can see that very soon, it doesn't take too long to figure out that probably this is what Paul's addressing. Because he says, such were some of you, but now they've stopped that relationship. And now perhaps the older man is just taking the, the boy under his wing as a son, as opposed to this apprentice who's being abused in order to learn the trade. Now we know that. That's historically well documented. So it's possible, it's possible that our Senecoiti could have been a pederast. In other words, an adult male who had sex with this child. And Malakos being soft could mean, it could have been implying that he was soft because he was not yet developed as a man, that he was still a child, he was a boy. So soft and arsenicoitai could have been referring to this relationship, which again was not necessarily, it wasn't considered in their society as a homosexual love affair. It was just simply an arrangement. Now that's one possibility. Interestingly enough, I said that these, this word arsenicoitai does not show up again for another 400 years though. And the person who retranslates it is the, uh, the church father, Jerome. And when Jerome retranslates it in 383, he translates the word arsenicoitai as the word male prostitute. This is a different concept. So I'm showing you it could have been that arrangement between the man and the boy. Jerome, 300 years later, 383 years later, thinks, no, this must have been a male prostitute. Now, why would Jerome, see, the Roman Empire was still intact when Jerome was writing. And so much of the society 
that Jerome was looking at is, was similar to the society that Paul was looking at. So when Jerome translates this word, arsenikoitai, as male prostitute, it's something that's very prevalent in his society. And the reason he uh, sees it as uh, no problem translating it that way is because male prostitution was not what we think of when we think of male prostitution in America today. It's not somebody standing on a street corner on 42nd Street in New York City waiting for someone to come by and give them 20 bucks or 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever they're looking for today. It was in fact completely encapsulated in the format of idolatry. In the city of Rome, there were 420 different temples to different gods and goddesses. It doesn't take very long if you start looking at Greek mythology and Roman mythology to see how many gods, how many goddesses they had. And each one in Rome, there were 420 different separate temples, each for a different god or goddess. No, none of them were repeated. Zeus didn't have two temples. There was the temple of Zeus, then the temple of Mercury, the temple of Pluto, the temple of Aphrodite. All of those different gods and goddesses, so-called, had their own temple. And within those temples, temple worship was not what we call temple worship today. It wasn't putting on an integrity tape and everybody singing Hosanna praises. It was instead prostitution because much of those uh, worship styles were, can, were uh, dealing with a god or goddess that you feared and that you felt you needed to appease. And in many cases, uh, the, the priest and the priestesses of those temples were prostitutes, paid prostitutes. You would have sex with the paid prostitute who was the priest or the priestess of the temple to appease the god or the goddess in order to, uh, to be in their favor, to have their favor, have them smile upon you, shine upon you. And if you know much about Greek or Roman mythology, those gods and those goddesses were not like Yahweh, Jehovah, the great god who changes not. They were very whimsical. They could get angry in a moment, according to their own stories. They could get angry in a moment and wipe out a town. They could come down and grab another goddess or grab somebody else and just rip them away, take them by their hair, rape them, do different kinds of things. They weren't godly. They were demonic. And so it was demons, in fact, because we know that these weren't real Jehovah-inspired God worship. It was demon worship. And so in demon worship, you have all kinds of perversions taking place. And it makes sense that if the word is male prostitute, meaning that the male was the prostitute priest of the temple, that yes, such were some of you, but now you've come to Jesus. How can you remain in Jesus and remain a prostitute of a temple of a foreign god? You can't. And so therefore, Jerome in 383 looked at the society around him. The Roman Empire was still intact and he said, ah, it's a male prostitute. That's what it is. That's what Paul's talking about. When the, he translated the word lift couch. So we know that uh, male prostitution was associated with Roman temples and pagan rites and it was, uh, it was very common. It was very common. So that's another possibility. A third possibility does not have anything to do with the word arsenikoitas, but does have to do with the word malakos. So that arsenikoitas could have been a, a temple prostitute. And malakos could have been something else that was very real in Paul's day. The word soft. Another legitimate translation of the word soft is jelly-like or spineless jelly-like or spineless. What was happening in the Roman Empire in Paul's day? Persecution broke out against Christians. Nero and other Caesars picked on Christians as the cause 
of all the ills of the Roman society. In Paul's day, Christians were being crucified. Christians were being rooted out just like Paul had done, going from home to home, ripping them out of their houses, throwing them into prison. Many of them were being martyred. Many of them were being thrown to the lions. Many of them were thrown before gladiators and made a spectacle for the Roman society. Right? We know that. Malakos, if it is talking about the spineless, and we do know that in the first century there was a problem that had to be addressed because people came to Christ. Then all of a sudden persecution breaks out. And while persecution is breaking out, some people, remember James talks about a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. There were people who were double-minded. Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus and Alexander the coppersmith. And there were many who were listed in the Bible as Demetrius. Others who were listed in the Bible as those who uh, became real troublemakers for the church, yet had been in the church. Demetrius, in fact, in, uh, in the little gospels, the little epistles, I mean, of John is referred to as one who actually controlled the church, but he wouldn't let anybody be a Christian. He wouldn't let them be hospitable. He wouldn't let them behave like Christians. Persecution breaking out caused people to behave in spineless ways. And when the Roman Empire came to you and a gladiator had his sword at your throat and said, are you a Christian? Some people were soft. Some people were spineless. Some people were jelly-like because with a knife at their throat, a sword at their throat, it was a lot easier to say no than to say yes. In the meantime, those who had the sword of the gladiator at their throat and said yes and were carted off and were martyred and were killed, when the person who was spineless repented because others in the Christian church, because the, they would come under conviction, you're either going to be in or you're going to be out with God. And because they come under conviction, they came back to the church. And this was a very real issue for the first century church. Do we forgive them and let them come back in and be a part of fellowship? Or do we say, no, you have renounced Christ. And local assembly to local assembly all throughout the Roman Empire had to deal with this issue because people were saying, no, I don't have anything to do with Christ. I don't want anything to do with Christ. The Roman Empire, the the uh, soldiers would put the knife to, the, to their child's throat and say, do you renounce Christ or we'll kill your kid? And many said, I don't know Christ. But then when the martyr's blood was spilled, they realized, no, I should have, never mind, I should have stood up for Christ. And when they repented, and so that is who also could be talked about in Malakos, the spineless. We know that in those three instances, if it was the man who took the boy under his wing and he became a Christian, he could have been convicted about this relationship abusing this child. We know that if it was Malakos, spineless, such were some of you, but you are washed. They're changed. You can't remain spineless and remain bold. You can't be both. You can't be in and you can't be out at the same time. If it's temple prostitute, such were some of you. And we know that's true. Very true. Why doesn't Paul talk about temple prostitutes in this list? If he's talking about something different, because that was something very real in his day. Well, he probably is. He very well could be. I, wanna, I want to uh, read you this again in 1 Corinthians. We need to look at this one more time in chapter 6 because you need to see what else it says here. Now, we're going to pick up with verse 9. Remember, we need to read through 10. Now, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, 
nor idolaters, nor adulterers, now I'm going to read it in Greek, nor malakos, nor arsenikoites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So obviously, whoever he's talking about, if they stayed in that state, they would not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If this word, our senecoites here, and the word malakos are talking about homosexuals, then what is a washed and sanctified and justified in the name of our, the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God? What is a justified, sanctified, and washed homosexual? Is a washed, sanctified, and justified homosexual a heterosexual? That's what some people think it says. If that were true, then every homosexual that ever came to Christ would be heterosexual. Because you can be sure every idolater, every temple prostitute, every thief, every covetous person, every drunkard, whoever came to Christ is changed. So if it's the word homosexual, then the only thing they could be is heterosexual. Unless you have to say, well, no, that's not necessarily so. A washed, sanctified, justified homosexual is a homosexual who's been washed, who's been sanctified, and who's been justified just like anybody else who's come to Christ. And that would certainly be so. A homosexual who is washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God is a homosexual who is washed and sanctified and justified. Just like, ask this, ask this question, what is a heterosexual who is washed and sanctified and justified? Are they an asexual person who has no sex? Is that so? What is a washed heterosexual? Aren't they a heterosexual still? but they're a washed one. So now they don't go lusting and whoring and adulterating uh, and cheating on their spouse and getting drunk every night and, and picking up somebody at singles bars all the time. They're still a heterosexual and they still function heterosexually, but differently because they're washed, because they're sanctified and because they're justified. I want to read this to you. Um, if it were so that homosexuals were being talked about here and if it were so that their being washed and sanctified and justified meant that they became heterosexuals, then you would see a large number of people who were ex-gay, ex-gays. And I want to read this because this is the testimony of two of the founders of the largest ex-gay ministry in America called Exodus. Let me read you their story. Michael Busey and Gary Cooper, the founders of Exodus International, a church-based coalition of ex-gay ministries, have denounced all such programs seeking to convert homosexuals into heterosexuals, according to the articles in The Sentinel, 2290 and the Bay Area Reporter, 2890. Busey remarked of the program, I had no success with them. I counseled hundreds of people who tried to change their sexual orientation and none of them were successful. If you got them away from the Christian limelight and asked them honestly now, are you saying that you are no longer homosexual and are now heterosexually oriented? Not one person said, yes, I am actually now a heterosexual. Not one out of hundreds that were counseled. Paul says, but such were some of you. So he must not be talking about this because this doesn't work. Whatever Paul was talking about does work because the Bible works. All right. Busey is now a family counselor for gay and lesbian couples. He admits that his past did work psychological damage. There may very well be out there people that I talk to who are dead now. 
because they committed suicide because of the guilt that I inadvertently heaped on them. I feel guilty about that. I mean it was well intentioned. I was getting brainwashed by the church. This is what I was supposed to be doing. But it damaged me. It damaged the people I talked to. One man, according to the pair, suffered such severe psychological damage that he mutilated his own genitals with a razor blade in a desperate attempt to rid himself of his sexual desires. Now that's not what Paul's talking about. Such were some of you, but you were washed, not mutilated with a razor blade. Another impulsively underwent an incomplete sex change operation because he believed his sexual desires might receive divine approval were he biologically a woman. But at the same time, I was convinced it was working, Busey said. Every once in a while, a crack in that conviction would occur. I'd ask, how come I'm still having these feelings? Now this is the president and founder of Exodus, which is still touted as the largest ex-gay ministry in America and was on the cover and a cover story of Charisma magazine just not too long ago and is funded by the church. I'd like to, I'd see a Christian psychologist and he'd say, oh, that's just temptation. Ignore it or suppress it. You are different. You are now ex-gay. You are no longer gay. Those feelings don't mean anything. But those feelings didn't go away for either of the men. In fact, even during their tenure with Exodus, some ex-gay counselors actively engaged in gay sex even after a full day of ex-gay counseling. must not be working. Both said they experienced such inner conflict that they decided to leave the organization in 1979, the organization they founded. Shortly before a general synod of the United Church of Christ, where the two were scheduled to appear, they decided to dramatically alter the talk they were expected to deliver. The United Church of Christ is expecting them to come and talk about ex-gays and they're starting to realize the truth of the matter. To the utter shock of the audience, they called for acceptance of lesbians and gays as they are. A stand that spelled a rapid end to their involvement in organized evangelical Christianity. Soon after their marriages ended in divorce, and they moved in together. So the Bible works. And so if Paul's talking about homosexuals, then it would be working. And heterosexuals would be ex-homosexuals. Homosexuals become heterosexuals. That's it. You wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. You wouldn't. But it isn't working. And a lot of people are trying to fool themselves to say that it is working. The next thing I want to point out in this passage in 1 Corinthians 6 is it says, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. See, a lot of people say that these people will never be saved. They can't go to heaven. In fact, I remember that and I, when we first taught this series that was back in, uh, in the 80s, the late 80s when we first taught this, and I remembered hear, hearing on the radio that day that we were going to talk about this scripture, a prominent evangelical uh, Pentecostal preacher on the radio with hundreds of radio stations preaching coast to coast around the world said, there will be no homosexuals or lesbians in heaven. Well, he was basing it on this passage that these people shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But you have to ask the question, what did Paul mean about inherit the kingdom of God? What does it mean to inherit the kingdom of God? Does it mean getting into heaven when you die? Most people think, yeah. But the Bible talks about something totally different when it talks about the kingdom of God. When it says inherit the kingdom of God, Let's let the Bible tell us what it means to inherit the kingdom of God. So let's let the Bible interpret for us what is the kingdom of God. Romans 14, 17 says, here's what the kingdom of God is. Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not, and so it tells you what it's not. It's not eating and drinking. What's eating and drinking? Eating and drinking are things that you do. 
The Holy Ghost doesn't make you eat. You have to put the fork to your own mouth. Drinking is not something that God makes you do. You've got to put the straw to your own lips or you've got to put the glass to your own mouth and you've got to swallow. So the kingdom of God is not something you do. It's not eating and drinking, stuff that you're responsible for. That's pretty important. It's not something you're responsible for. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God's not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is three things. Number one is righteousness. Are you the author of your righteousness? Are you the author of it? The cross, the price that was paid through Jesus Christ makes Jesus the author of our righteousness. It's his righteousness. What does the Bible say about our righteousness? It says our righteousness is like filthy rags. So the kingdom of God is not like filthy rags. The kingdom of God is righteousness, not like filthy rags, but like the king of kings righteousness, which he gives to us. Such were some of you, but you are washed by the blood. The kingdom of God is peace. We're talking here about the peace that passes understanding, the peace of God that guards your heart and your mind, the peace of God that rules in your heart. Where does that come from? Do you fabricate it? It comes again from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It is, in fact, a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is a third thing. It is joy in the Holy Ghost. Who gives you that? Do you get that yourself? Or is it something God gives you? So if we look at these three items of what the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God is righteousness. You didn't buy it. It was bought for you. Can I determine for you whether you have righteousness or not? How does a person know if they have righteousness or not? They have to ask the question, do I belong to Jesus? If I belong to Jesus, then I have righteousness. If I don't belong to Jesus, I don't have righteousness. Now, does that mean that a heterosexual who does not belong to Jesus has righteousness just because he's a heterosexual? Does it mean that a lesbian who belongs to Jesus has righteousness or unrighteousness based on her sexual orientation? It had nothing to do with her sexual orientation. It has everything to do with whether she belongs to Jesus because righteousness does not come from being a lesbian. Righteousness comes from being in Christ. Right? Amen. All right. So how about peace? If I look at you, can I really tell whether you have peace or not? No. I might tell you I have peace. You see, I could put on a mask. I can lie through my teeth. I can put a big smile on my face, wear a facade, and say, I have the peace of God that passes understanding. And you might believe me. But the only one who really knows whether I have peace is who? Which human being really knows whether I have peace? So which human being really knows whether you have peace? You do, right? So I can't judge whether you're a Christian and I can't judge whether you have the kingdom of God. I can't judge whether you have inherited righteousness and peace unless you can witness that you have peace. The author of the truth of the kingdom of God being inherited is the person who has inherited it. Not the person who looks with a micro, my microscope or a magnifying glass to see whether I see it there or not. I'm not going to see it. Now, I might see exterior things, smile on your face and things like that, but those things could fool me. I could see you acting kind and being a nice person, but those things could fool me. Whether you have inherited the kingdom of God or not, the only one who knows is you. And the third item in the kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Ghost. Who knows whether you have joy in the Holy Ghost or not? 
Who's the person you can trust the most? So if a lesbian or a gay man has righteousness because they're in Christ, and if they have peace, and if they have joy in the Holy Ghost, have they inherited the kingdom of God? According to the Bible, they have. Amen? Now, that's not all. Uh, if I want to look up the word kingdom, and if I want to look up the word kingdom in, in Strong's, I have to look up the word 932. And do you know how many references there are to the kingdom in Strong's? Columns after columns after columns after columns. So how am I going to determine whether or not you've got the kingdom or not? I have to rely on you telling me whether you've got the kingdom. And then the only other thing I can watch is in Matthew 7, 21 that says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, enters into the kingdom, but the one who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So I have to believe you if you tell me you've got peace and you've got joy in the Holy Ghost. And the only other thing I can watch exterior on the exterior is to see your behavior if you do the will of my Father which is in heaven based on the Word of God. So if I watch you and I see, okay? Luke 17, 21 says, Behold, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. So inheriting the kingdom of God is not one day when I die and they throw me six feet under the ground and put that little bit of dirt on my head. My getting into the pearly gates with St. Peter ushering me in. That's not inheriting the kingdom of God. Inheriting the kingdom of God is getting it right now, right here, because I'm saved. That's what it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20 says, the kingdom is not in word. So it's not just my saying I've got the kingdom. The kingdom is not in word only, but in power. So there ought to be a changed life. And that's what the Bible says, such were some of you. Your life's been changed, though. Power. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Galatians 5, 22 through 25 says there's a lot of fruit of the Holy Spirit that you're going to see in a person's life. If they've got the Holy Spirit, there's going to be fruit for that Holy Spirit. And then it goes ahead and gives you the instruction to the church, it is saying, walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. Which means even though you've inherited the kingdom of God, you can still make a choice to walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. So you have been given the instruction out of the Bible the church at Galatia was given the instruction to the spirit-filled, tongue-talking believers, hey, folks, walk after the spirit. Here's people who've inherited the kingdom of God, and they've still got to be told, get your act together. Walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. So you see, if I try to judge what's going on in you based on what I'm seeing, you might need a rebuke. You still might be saved. And if you were to die, you might still get into heaven. Thank God it's not based on what I know. It's based on what he knows, what God knows. Amen? And if I look at this last scripture, if you'll look at it with me, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made me meet to be partakers of the inheritance. Inherited the kingdom of God. The inheritance of the saints in light. Okay, stop right there. Who's made me meet? Who's made me fit to be a partaker of the inheritance? Look at your English, your structure, your grammatical structure. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made me fit. So it's not up to me. I don't do it. I can't make myself fit. God does it. The Father does it. And give thanks unto the Father which has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He made us fit. 
who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Who delivered us from the power of darkness? The Father delivered us from the power of darkness. He did it. Who delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us or transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Who put us into the kingdom of God? The kingdom of Jesus. Who put us there? The Father put us there. We didn't put ourselves there. The Father did it. Who delivered us from the power of darkness? Did we suddenly get so good that we got out of darkness's control? No, the Father snatched us out. The word for translated is this word that implies violence. And it is like just going, reaching down and grabbing and ripping out out of the kingdom of darkness and transferring us into the kingdom of Jesus. The Father. The Father did it. And how do you do it? Verse 14 in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So such were some of us, thieves, adulterers, kidnappers, revilers, fornicators, malakos, spineless, temple prostitutes, people who abused children, extortioners, drunkards, revilers. Such were some of us. But we are washed by the blood of the Lamb. And without the blood, there's no hope. But thank God there is blood. Because the Bible says, without blood there is no remission of sins. But there is blood. So there is remission of sins. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you that even when we were spineless, even when we were revilers, even when we were all kinds of things we should have never been, you washed us. You transferred us. You sent your son to die for us. I thank you today, Father, that you have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And if we are open to receiving the gifts that you've got for us. You transfer us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son by our simple act of faith, asking and believing that Jesus died for our sins. So our sins are taken care of and we're standing in the righteousness of God before you by receiving that as a gift from you. We believe it, we confess it with our mouth, and you fill us with the peace that passes understanding. And you fill us with the joy of the Holy Ghost. And we thank you for it because the joy of the Lord is our strength. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod. If you will keep my Sabbath and please me in your ways, I'll be your God and add unto you many, many days. Take hold of my covenant.